Welcome to Channel 17, the Town of Colony Government Channel. It's been said that once you have tasted flight, you will forever walk the earth with your eyes turned skyward. For there you have been, and there you will always long to return. Since the dawn of time, man has looked to the sky in bewilderment and dreamed of soaring among the clouds. Many of the early flying contraptions were piloted by aeronauts, as they were called, all pioneers who risked their lives in the pursuit of manned flight. Up, up, a little bit higher, oh, by the moon is on fire. Come, Josephine, in my flying machine, going up, all on goodbye. This is the story of one of America's unknown aviation pioneers, John McDonald Miller. As a young boy, Johnny Miller's interest was to follow in his father's footsteps and become a steam locomotive engineer. But on May 29, 1910, Four-year-old Johnny Miller witnessed something that would change his ambitions and set the course for the rest of his life. May 29, 1910 was a big change in American history because it was the longest flight ever made in an airplane in the U.S., but also started the long career of John Miller in aviation. It was on that historic day that inventor Glenn Hammond Curtis landed his flying machine, a pusher plane he called the Hudson Flyer, in a field across the road from Johnny's home in Poughkeepsie, New York. The flying machines were a big curiosity. His father took him down there to see this unique airplane that had landed to be refueled, one of the two stops Curtis was allowed to make. The New York World made this offer of $10,000 for somebody to fly from Albany to New York in 1910, by October of 1910, um, and was allowed two stops. Well, they were draining the gasoline out of a automobile and then pouring it in the airplane and I asked my father, why are they putting water in the, in the flying machine? He said, that's not water, that's called gasoline. That's what makes the engine run. <laughs> I remember that. From that moment on, John Miller forgot everything he knew about locomotives and just wanted to be a pilot. From heavy locomotives to light airplanes. <laughs> After World War I, the government sold many surplus jennies. The pilots who bought them came to be known as barnstormers or gypsy pilots and even flying fools. Well, the air's pretty bumpy up there. He's going to make it. No, he misses. No contact that time. Let's try again. You know, a stunt like this is just a matter of perfect coordination and paint is bound to determine that he's going to make it. In 1923, a barnstorming pilot named Swanee Taylor made his way to Poughkeepsie in a jenny in very poor condition. John worked in a machine shop during this time and would rush out to help Swanee, free of charge, to crank the propeller and do whatever Swanee needed John to do. It was soon evident to Swanee that John knew more about airplanes than he did. He was amazed that I knew how to fix a magneto and all kinds of things, and, and I, I maintained the airplane for him. He had been given an airplane by an earlier barnstormer. That was called a Jenny, JN4, World War I training plane. He abandoned the airplane. 
and said, you can have it. He walked away from it after he made, I don't know how many flights, taking people up at a dollar a flight. <laughs> it still had one dollar a flight painted on the side of the deteriorating fuselage when Dad took it over and rebuilt it. I fixed up anything that needed to be fixed, and then I put it on new fabric. Good yeah. job, boy, I had it on the porch here. Four wings and the fuselage and everything on the front porch. Painting him with dope. Some job, boy. He had re-skinned it um, as necessary to, to fix holes in the wings. He worked on the engine and, and gotten up to par to where, where he could taxi it around. Um, and it had a tail skid, so it was fairly hard to control on the ground. Uh, so he had decided that after, after school every day, he would go out to this field and he'd fire this thing up and cruise around the field. Well, I understood the operation of the airplane, and I was able to hop it and fry it across over the grass and keep the wings level and keep it straight. And I turned around and go the other way. Here's a guy that wants to fly, can't wait, gets this airplane all fixed up and restored, and sure, there it is. What do you do? He started ferrying it, trying it out back and forth across the field. So he's taxiing around in this Jenny and he throttled it up a little bit too far, so he decided to just take off. Well, it's like uh, Dad's car, you know? You want to learn to drive, and they're away, and you say, well, let me just take it down the driveway. Let me take it out on the road. Next thing you're on the highway, and you don't have a license. So Johnny is going to say, well, I'm going to just taxi the airplane a little bit. Well, taxi a little bit more. This is pretty nice. Next thing you know, he's airborne. Well, yeah, I took off and fell. That's the way I learned to fly. I didn't have an instructor. I'm all a glitter and all a pearl. But I knew the principles of it. I didn't bust it. Didn't bust my neck either. <laughs> he flew down to uh, another field where he thought he would be able to land because the, the field he was actually in was pretty small. Of course, everybody, all the neighbors thought I was crazy. <laughs> so he landed there and uh, hung out there for a little while, just kind of in awe, I think, of that he just actually flew for the first time with, with no real professional training at all. And then he flew back to the field where he had started. And in landing, there was a local farmer that saw that he was flying this plane around there. And came over to the plane, he said, oh, a dollar a ride. It was still painted on the side of the fuselage. And Dad said, yes, a dollar a ride. So he took the farmer up for a ride. And on his first day flying, he became a commercial pilot. John's fondest memories are of flying his old Jenny in the days before regulations. There was complete freedom of the air, and he took advantage of it. John thoroughly enjoyed flying up into scattered fluffy clouds on a fine summer day and playing around in them. It was both fun and valuable experience. Johnny's a natural. I mean, he was born with wings and uh, has made such a wonderful career of that. But to, to me, uh, just to get in an airplane and go and just, well, okay, let's see what happens here. That's, that's the true adventurer. In 1927, John attended Pratt Institute of Technology in Brooklyn and studied mechanical engineering. By 1931, he had an engineering education and seven years of successful flying behind him. On May 19th, John traveled to Roosevelt Field in Long Island to see Charles Lindbergh and the Spirit of St. Louis the day before his historic transatlantic flight. I decided I would go back to, I wanted to see him take off in the morning. So I went to the hotel and I didn't have any money, so they let me sleep on the floor with several other people. And uh, then I saw him take off the next morning. The ground was wet and it wasn't muddy, but it was a slight amount of mud on the surface and the wheels were splashing the mud, or the water out of the mud. And he finally got off and went over the wires by about 20 feet of clearance. Uh, I stood right behind him and watched him. I was afraid he wasn't gonna make it. I just held my breath all that time he was taking off and then finally I took a breath. <laughs> On the evening of May 21st, Lindbergh crossed the coast of France, 
followed the Seine River to Paris and touched down at La Bourget Field at 10.22 p.m. The waiting crowd of 100,000 rushed the plane. He became an instant hero. New York City gave him the largest ticker tape parade ever. I remember when he came back, they had a big parade on Fifth Avenue, and I sat in a ninth story window watching the parade. In May 1931, John bought a brand new Pitcairn Auto Gyro for $15,000. Grandpa signed up to, to purchase the first autogyro. And the autogyro was the forebear of the helicopter. And uh, the autogyro rotor was driven by the air. And it went up through, the rotor was like this, and the air was going up through it. And that's what made the rotor turn. The helicopter, the rotor is turned by the engine, and it blows air down, and that's what supports the aircraft. And that's what they use today. The Autogyro was the forebear of the helicopter. He had planned on making the first transcontinental flight by an autogyro and to later demonstrate the aircraft in a series of exhibition appearances. I ordered the Autogyro for delivery on May 1st, and I got a notice from the pet carrying company that they were sorry, but the delivery would be delayed until May 15th. And then I read in the newspaper, the New York Times, that Amelia Earhart was at the factory and she was going to make the first transcontinental flight with the autogyro. So I jumped in my airplane and flew down to the factory to find out what was going on. The sales manager wanted Amelia Earhart to make the flight because he'd get better publicity for the autogyro. And uh, so, uh, then they told me they'd switch name plates. But Amelia Earhart then had signed up as well, and she had signed up for number 13. She didn't want number 13. Being the unlucky number that, and her being so superstitious, decided that 13 was not for her, and so they had actually switched the, the number plates at the factory so that Amelia got number 11 and Grandpa got number 13. They wanted to give her the other job ahead of me so she could make the flight. It was a dirty trick that the sales manager was playing on me. But she got all the publicity, which of course burned Dad up. <laughs> and then when he was readying an autogyro to fly across the country, it would have been the first transcontinental rotorcraft flight. She also was revving up to go across, and she actually took off, I believe, ahead of him, but cracked the autogyro up, walked away from it, saying, this plane is unsafe at any speed, at any altitude, and he was so upset. If she landed it like an airplane. Well, that's not the way to fly an autogyro. You're supposed to fly an autogyro like that, and land it like a bird. And, uh, so I got talking to her. She didn't know who I was. I'm sure she didn't know who I was. I was talking to her and she said, I'm not interested in all that aerodynamic stuff. I just want to fly out to California and back. That's one reason he has very little respect for her. Because he managed to be the first to ever fly across the country in a rot rotary craft. The first transcontinental autogyro flight. But the Autogyro was the safest aircraft. By far the safest aircraft ever developed was the Autogyro. Nobody ever got hurt in an Autogyro. When I was doing a lot of research on motion picture stunt pilots, one of them was Al Wilson. And in the uh, air races, where John Miller was to demonstrate a autogyro. And I was looping the autogyro. At the time, Al Wilson was demonstrating a very heavily modified Curtis Pusher. I had the engine behind the pilot, and the pilot sat out in front with a nose wheel. And he was flying one of those, an old airplane. Of course, we're talking about technology that goes back uh, 20 years earlier. So here we are flying this airplane, and Johnny's flying with him. And he and I were flying at the same time, we'd pass each other. 
one with the auto drive, one with the pusher. It's evidently reported the downwash of the propeller because Al got too close. When you make a vertical descent like that, you're pulling a lot of air down with you. The air is supporting the aircraft. And he made a dive at me, and that downdraft pushed him right down into my rotor of the auto drive. And his wheel cut one blade off, about five or six feet of the blade was broken off, and took the wheel off his airplane, and he crashed and was killed. You see all these people run over to the Curtis Pusher, and nobody really went over to the auto gyro, which also got severely damaged. Nice guy, too, too bad. He was a well known uh, movie pilot. Johnny, you know, survived, fortunately, and uh, lived a tale of tale, and, and, and it's a remarkable piece of footage to see. The show went on, and another plane did take off at the time. The year was 1939. Eastern Airlines and its leader Eddie Rickenbacker, a World War I flying ace and hero, was ready to operate a fully certified scheduled airline of six miles, the shortest in the world, between Philadelphia across the Delaware River to the airport in Camden, New Jersey to deliver mail. They set up a complete station on the roof of the General Post Office building. They were the first rooftop scheduled operation and the only one so far in the history of aviation. Nobody else has bothered to do it. <laughs> but I carried 10 flights a day for a year, six days a, a, six day, days a week. And that was just an experiment. The roof of the post office building was designed with future helicopter usage in mind. It was given plenty of strength for that purpose. However, it was a rectangular building facing north-south with long penthouse structures at least 20 feet high along the east and west sides. The flying area was a channel between them. It had the potential for an aerodynamic disaster with severe turbulence of varying kinds and winds blowing in different directions. The roof was designed especially for that. Yeah, that's the only one ever used it. When the congressional bill was written for authorization and funding of the project, John had written into it that normal weather restrictions for flying were not to apply to the operation of the autogyro due to its unique flying characteristics. The pilot was to be the only judge of when he would fly in the weather. That set a precedent, which seems to stand today for rotary wing aircraft, the present day helicopters. The roof is still there, the post office is still there. <laughs> I didn't bust it. <laughs> Captain Miller flew the operation for the year's contract, more than 2,500 flights without an accident. But World War II had put a damper on the postal run, and the experiment ended in 1940. Captain Miller continued to fly DC-3s and eventually the jet-powered DC-8s out of Newark and LaGuardia throughout the East Coast during his 25 years with Eastern Airlines. John's lifetime flight record is well over 35,000 hours in the air. In 2002, Captain Miller was inducted into the Experimental Aircraft Association's Vintage Aviation Hall of Fame. Today, Captain Miller still lives in his father's home in Poughkeepsie, New York. At 103 years old, his passion for life and his love of flying is still evident from the many stories he loves to tell to anyone with the time to listen. When we were in flight, we would talk about flying um, and the history of, of all the things that he's been able to experience. I was always very curious, so I'd, I'd ask a lot of questions, and he's more than happy to talk about it. Well, of course, I wasn't born yet when he was barnstorming. We grew up hearing these marvelous stories about the first day he ever flew. When I talk to Johnny Miller, when I see Johnny Miller, when I think about Johnny Miller, it's like a time capsule to me. It's that one piece of the book that you read about going, what was it like to be there then? That here he is right in front of us and remembers all of this stuff. Can talk about 1910, talk about meeting Glenn Curtis. Who could you think of today who could say that and is a pilot? Uh, to me, that's remarkable. It's that one little piece of the past still there that we can still, you know, hone in on. And so, 
you know, conversations with Johnny, you just soak up as much as you can because uh, there's nobody, nobody like him. I don't know how to stop frying. I like to fry. Early aviation started at his front door. Captain John McDonald Miller is one of America's true aviation pioneers whose life has spanned the era from Jennies to Jets. Welcome to Channel 17, the Town of Colony Government Channel.